and welcome to This Week in Social Justice. I'm Daisy Cousins and I'll be discussing all the biggest and baddest social justice fails of the past seven days. This week we have the critics who hate Bohemian Rhapsody for lacking all the right identity politics, Jen Yu Harry, the latest and greatest feminist obsession, and depending on how long I feel like talking about the first two topics, we may even get time for a bonus topic. So, let's get started. Another year, another award show. The 2019 Golden Globe Awards have come and gone, and of course there was the usual speculation as to who would win what. However, it was an apparently unexpected double victory for Queen biopic Bohemian Rhapsody. The film beat frontrunners A Star Is Born and Black Panther to take out Best Picture, and leading actor Rami Malek won Best Actor for his performance of Freddie Mercury. And I, personally, was thrilled to bits. When I saw Bohemian Rhapsody a couple of months ago, I went in a Queen novice, and I left the cinema wondering why I hadn't been a die-hard Queen fan all my life. The film was, in my humble layperson opinion, wonderful. Now, of course, there were some who disagreed with my starry-eyed view, namely die-hard Queen fans who'd followed the band all of their lives and thought that the film was biased or revisionist or glossed over key details. Fair enough. There are certainly solid, technical arguments to be made as to why the film should or shouldn't have won the top award. I actually enjoyed reading some of the reviews that were critical of Bohemian Rhapsody, if only to learn more about Queen. However, when I came across the oh-so-progressive HuffPost's take on the situation, it did cause me to raise an eyebrow. See, rather than critique the film's inaccuracies or direction or performances or costume design, etc., HuffPost's Marina Fang took issue with the fact the film's focus was not Freddie's so-called identity. Bohemian Rhapsody winning for Best Motion Picture Drama was a questionable choice. The Globes rewarded a standard music biopic that doesn't adequately address Queen frontman Freddie Mercury's queer and Parsi identity. This sentiment was echoed by Out Magazine's Matthew Rodriguez. Bohemian Rhapsody goes to great lengths to paint Mercury's sexuality as a problem. Though he's shown to be deeply in love with a woman, all of his dalliances with men are either seedy or with snakes looking to use him for his money. And, of course, the usual Twitter crowd were making all of the same noises. This criticism of the film is not new. There were articles, again, from HuffPost and others stating similar just after the film's release, and there were even complaints about this made right back when the trailer was released in early 2018. Anyone else mildly annoyed enough to tweet about it that the Bohemian Rhapsody trailer features gay slash bi superstar Freddie Mercury flirting with and twirling with a woman but no indication of his love of men? While those who are perplexed are perfectly entitled to their opinion, this obsession with identity politics is getting a little old-fashioned. That a film good enough to win a Golden Globe, with a leading player proficient enough to win Best Actor, can be fobbed off as problematic by Team Woke for literally not being gay enough, presents as a little tedious. Especially when the filmmakers had good reason for making it so. The film's intention, as asserted by Queen Band members Brian May and Roger Taylor, was to focus on the band's journey, not their frontman's personal life. As for Mercury's Parsi identity, well, it wasn't key to Queen's rise to stardom, so why would it be given any more credence than necessary? The film these team work critics were salivating for would have been entitled Freddie Mercury, A Life, not Bohemian Rhapsody. In addition, presenting Mercury's sexuality as the centerpiece of the film would have been historically inaccurate. Attitudes to the LGBT community were sadly different in the 1980s. According to Queen biographer Leslie Ann Jones, Queen's management spent decades trying to convince the world that Freddie was heterosexual while he was alive, but then conceded to his homosexuality after he had died. All their efforts to preserve Freddie in memory as, effectively, a straight man who was in love with one woman, his soulmate Mary, but who was corrupted by factions of the music industry and wasn't really gay, are ridiculous to me. But historical and contextual accuracy are not enough for Team Woke. They would sooner alter the perception of history than have their preferred progressive narrative temporarily out of the spotlight. You remember that really bad take on Dunkirk by USA Today's Brian Truitt? 
The fact that there are only a couple of women and no lead actors of colour may rub some the wrong way. This Bohemian Rhapsody thing is almost as bad. Now look. We shouldn't really be too surprised at this identity politics infested criticism of Bohemian Rhapsody because it is totally in line with the general tone of this year's Golden Globes. Much fuss was made of Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther, not because they were terrific films but because of their largely non-white casts. Which is a terrible shame because in the case of Crazy Rich Asians, I haven't seen Black Panther, I absolutely loved it because it was a crackin' good film. I didn't care about the ethnicity of the cast. It was also left no secret that actress Sandra Oh was the first woman of Asian descent to host the ceremony and that she was the first in 39 years to win Best Actress in a TV Drama. I said yes to the fear of being on this stage tonight because, because I wanted to be here to look out into this audience and witness this moment of change. And I'm not fooling myself. I'm not fooling myself. Next year could be different. It probably will be. But right now, this moment is real. How ironic then that Rami Malek, whose parents are Egyptian, was not met with the same diversity accolades when he won his award. Evidently, if you do not 100% fit the team woke narrative, you don't get any sort of credit, no matter how brilliant you are. Huge, massive social justice fail on this one. It's only January and already we are seeing the latest and greatest feminist obsession of 2019. Welcome to Genuhairy, when women all over the world are ditching the razors and letting their body hair grow wild and free for all to see. I'm talking armpits, legs and everywhere in between. So why are they doing it? Well. Nobody's really sure. See, this removal of body hair thing is being presented as a kind of sticking it to patriarchal standards because apparently women are forced to remove all of their body hair from the neck down lest they attract the disapproval of men. Now, 30 years ago, this was true. Women were very much held to a standard of beauty with not a lot of wiggle room. So back then, a woman growing out her body hair was in fact an act of rebellion. But the thing is, Feminists have already won that culture war. They won it decades ago. Nowadays, no one cares. woman nowadays and growing out your body hair is about as radical and original as pink fairy floss. Go to any university campus or inner city coffee bar and you'll find plenty of hairy pitted ladies sipping lattes while manspreading and talking loudly about how much they hate Donald Trump. The only people nowadays who make a fuss about women's body hair are women whose bread and butter literally depends on them having things to complain about. Do you know what one thing my armpit hair does is it filters out the kind of men who think that's important. <laughs> and right. as far as I'm concerned, that's an absolute plus. That's a straight up win. Right. Yeah. Already, so, somebody in the vicinity who's going to make a fuss about something as natural and normal as that. Actually, the only ones, the only ones Cheerio. making a fuss are people like you who are engaging publicly in January. Now, you'd think that was the social justice fail, right? Wrong. 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 That is it's wrong. And he did the wrong thing. Wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Proof. The real fail here is that the main reason the campaign was created in the first place is not getting anywhere near enough attention. January was created by 21-year-old Laura Jackson a drama student who grew out her hair for a role and despite receiving a few raised eyebrows and questions from family and friends, decided she liked it and wanted to keep it. So she started the campaign and a GoFundMe to raise funds for Body Gossip, which is a body positivity charity. And no, I'm not talking about this kind of body positivity. I mean the promotion of being genuinely comfortable with who you are as a person. However, aside from a few tokenistic mentions here and there, usually halfway down the pages of The Guardian, I feel that Laura Jackson is getting proportionately very little credit for creating something that is a really good initiative. 
Instead, the movement, of course, has been hijacked by people like Kate Smirthwaite, who are using it to push this idea that their brand of victim feminism is somehow relevant. It's not really. No, no, no. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Look, if you're a woman and you like growing out your body hair, all power to you. But don't go acting like it's some sort of countercultural act of resistance or bravery. It's not. And it hasn't been for several years. So, and credit where credit is due, I have put the link to Laura Jackson's GoFundMe and also a link to Body Gossip in the video description. Please feel free to check it out, it is a good cause. Enormous, huge, massive social justice fail on behalf of feminist attention seekers on this one. Unfortunately, I have talked for so long about the first two topics that we don't have time for a bonus topic. But tune in next time, because you never know, you might get lucky. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for other ways you can support me.